For me, Solve is an opportunity to innovate, not in isolation, but innovate as a team of teams with other people that are doing amazing things that without Solve, I would not have been connected to or known about. It's been amazing interacting both with the uh, soul organizers, but as well as the solvers. I'm very excited for the next couple of months as we get to know much better uh, other solvers as well as the community in general. We work with you as an applicant to finesse your idea, to get better at pitching it, um, to work through some of its potential weaknesses, and to potentially find some other team members on areas where you need to uh, strengthen your, your work. I think there's a, there's a level of trust with MIT, and I think there's a level of trust that the rigor of judging will be very high and very honest. Um, and the relationship with the members is that um, they have now a curated set of submissions that they can take seriously. The curating function of Solve is of greatest benefit to people looking to fund and invest in initiatives to improve the developing world. Solve can provide a validating forum for ideas and technology which essentially is almost a stamp of approval so that it's doing a part of the due diligence. And so I think it will actually help funders move more quickly and more effectively. If you have a great idea, be it a concept, a prototype, or a pilot, and you want to get it done, you need the right partners. You need people who are going to finance, you, you need people who are going to mentor you, you need to, people who are going to provide you a market or a network so that you can really get that done. This is what Solve offers. There are many people out there that want to make a contribution, that want their lives to work towards something that is really important, that has a common meaning. If you want to contribute to one of those challenges, just join the force, join the effort. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Executive Director, MIT Solve, Alex Amoyel. Hello, everyone. I'm Alex Amoyel, the Executive Director of Solve, an initiative of MIT. I'm honored to be here today to tell you uh, a little bit more about Solve ahead of a great announcement and conversation between Yo-Yo Ma and Neri Oxman from the MIT Media Lab. How will young people have jobs in the workforce of the future when automation is eliminating entire industries? How will women fully participate in the economy when today they're excluded and marginalized in many societies and when they are consistently underpaid? How can we ensure brain and mental health become as important to people as physical health? How can city dwellers, who will substantially increase in the next decades, get healthy food and clean water without depleting our planet's resources? These are big challenges. The type of challenges that an institution like MIT, founded as a school of practical application, of problem solving, and of real entrepreneurial spirit, has sought to tackle since its founding. But how can MIT continue to fulfill and expand its mission in the 21st century when some businesses have bigger revenues than countries? When there are over 7.5 billion people on this planet, but only a select few's talent and ingenuity is utilized? To make this vision a reality, we created Solve, a marketplace for social impact innovation that rests on several core values. First, we're optimists. We can solve the world's challenges, and there are already plausible innovations out there, but we must unearth them and secure the resources to scale and replicate these. Second, we, whether that's MIT or any other actor, cannot do this alone. We live in an interconnected, interdependent world, and the solutions to the key challenges facing this world require cross-industry, cross-sector, and cross-border cooperation. This is why we're here at Concordia today. Third. We believe that technology is a core part of the solution, but that it's not sufficient alone. We must ensure technology, which has always allowed human progress and prosperity, is adapted, deployed, distributed to all, even the most remote and the most vulnerable. Fourth, 
Finally, and perhaps most importantly, we believe in open innovation. By that, I mean that there's talent and ingenuity everywhere. There are teachers in US public schools. There are adolescent girls in Afghanistan. There are young men in Tunisia with lots of world experience, intelligence, and generosity, but no opportunity to develop these talents and to use their skills. It's our job to unearth their ideas and help unlock their human potential by being a platform that connects them with the resources they need to change their community and the world. So where are we now on this open innovation journey? Solve issued four challenges these past May that you saw earlier on youth, women and tech, brain health and sustainable urban communities. Anyone in the world could participate and submit a solution or comment or vote on our open innovation platform. Some of you here in this room today submitted solutions or voted or even came to one of our solver sums that we hosted around the world from Chicago to Tel Aviv to Jakarta and Ramallah. Thank you. And we were most impressed by the response to our challenges overall. 950 solutions from 103 countries, over 44,000 online participants, and 25,000 votes. Our judges from across industry, government, and academia selected the 68 most promising solutions, and we hosted our Solve Challenge Finals just yesterday. So I'm proud to announce that, we, that there we selected 38 solvers and that some of them are in the room with us today. Emma Yang is a 13-year-old, 13, developing an app to support people with Alzheimer's. Richard Rowe is an 84-year-old working on an off and online learning platform for communities in East Africa. And Amrita Segal has developed a fully biodegradable, biodegradable seven cent sanitary pad made out of waste banana fiber for women in India and around the world. And these are just a few of our incredible solvers. I invite you to come and meet them after this panel or through our staff later, and more importantly, to partner with them and accelerate their work, because that's what Solve is all about. Solve is not about MIT working alone. It's an opportunity to roll up your sleeves and participate in collective problem solving at a global scale. Solve is about creating partnerships with corporations, foundations, investors, nonprofits, government, academia, to accelerate great innovative solutions. And we can only do that when we work together. So I'm inviting people in this room to take part. Partner with our solvers. Input on our next set of challenges. Become a member or partner of Solve and come to our events. Submit your very own solution in the next cycle. I hope many of you will join the movement going forward and get your colleagues and networks to join too. Yesterday, during our finals, we announced our selected solvers across all of our challenges. But we're here today to focus on the recipients of the Arts and Culture Mentorship Prize. This is, prize is the result of Yo-Yo Ma's passion for the arts and culture and a partnership between him and MIT Solve to reflect the key role arts and culture play in innovation in addition to technology. Before I ask the prize's curator, Yo-Yo Ma, to come on stage to introduce the recipients, Let's take a look at this short video recap. Thank you. I believe strongly that the arts, alongside science and technology, are important collaborators in solving the most intractable problems for society. And I am pledging to assemble a team of mentors in the arts and sciences to mentor up to three teams who submit solutions in these areas. So thank you again for participating and we're really excited to see what comes of this. Thank you all for being here. My name's Yo-Yo Mom, 
And this is like sort of like the Emmys. I'm holding very important documents in my, in my hand. I'm so excited that this year, Solve has decided to have an arts and culture uh, part to it. And I'm involved because I so believe in how culture and technology and the sciences, when combined together, can provide a different kind of solution to the world's intractable problems. So glad that you're all here. And we know that when we announce the winners, um, we will continue to work with the, um, the, the winners in order so that they can actually take what they want to do most to scale. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to announce the first winner, Erase All Kittens. Yes. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Do we have a photo? Thank you. Need a photo? Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot. Okay. Um, and this is alphabetical, so this is not in order of preference, but the second one is Girls Who Build. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come. Should we have a photo? And should, we, should we have a photo? I know. No, I mean, you can go over there, too. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yay. Congratulations. All right. Thank you. And the third one. Memory Well. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. I'm going to stay here. Um, so, as I was saying, no, this is, I hope you're all taking in these remarkable people that are coming. Oh, my goodness. How are you? Great to see you. A kiss. Wow. Is that God, okay? Like, it's preferred. Is that allowed? It's preferred. It's, it's not technologically <laughs> sound, but Mwah. there you go. Great to see you. You, too. Great. Thanks. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Yo-Yo. Uh, thank you, Neri. Thank you all for being here. Um, gosh, I'm honored to be here for such a thoughtful, smart, important conversation. Because right now, especially in the news business, it really feels like we're missing a lot of thoughtfulness. Um, so Yo-Yo, let's start with you. You've just given an important award. I want you to speak about how oftentimes art and science both address the human condition, both look into solving problems that plague the world. In terms of art, how important is it now? And where does it intersect with science? Because for laymen like me, we look at art over here, and we look at science over here, and we don't realize how intertwined they are. Well, uh, first of all, I don't think I'm a, the greatest expert on speaking on, on those subjects. But from what I know, from my point of view, is that um, art or music, the visual arts, the musical arts, the theatrical arts, is a language. And you use the language to express content from what you observe. And from what you observe, you want to try and get to uh, the closest thing to a match from what is going on inside the brain to something that becomes audible, visible, touchable. And so the process is going from concept to execution. I'm wondering, I, I see you nod your head now. Because <laughs> I have a model for that. Oh, tell us. And the model is called the Krebs cycle of creativity. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it basically uh, hypothesizes that they are all connected. 
the, the connection between, let's say, art, science, engineering, and design, um, if you transcend the appropriation of those domains as single domains, as single rubrics, let's say, art, design, science, and engineering, but rather you see them as a cycle, then the input for one domain becomes the output for another. So I'll explain. Um, art and science have in common or share um, the questioning of the world around us. Um, artists or scientists look into the world to, um, uh, to understand it, to explain it, and to predict it. So scientists generate theorems, right? So they convert information into knowledge. Engineers take that knowledge and create utility, things that we can use and build. Designers take that utility and convert it into a human experience. And artists take this human experience, the cultural condition, and question it and question our perception of reality. So this is art at 12 o'clock, the Cinderella moment. And if you believe in the Cinderella moment, you can move from art to science. But art and science question the world. Uh, engineering and design, uh, well, design for me is everything, but engineering and design build in the world. So perception and production. So these are all, these are all connected, of course. And love they require that. I love that. Like that. I love it. <laughs> then what, if data and science are here, what can art express that data can't? My goodness. Um, well, data is something that, to your earlier point, uh, is there at the service of something else, right? Data is, you could say, well, okay, the universe is information, maybe. Um, but, but I would say that data, well, I would say that Art tries to do two things at the same time. It tries to get you incredibly involved in this most specific moment of time. But also, it needs to, at the same time, it's like storytelling, you know, you go for the biggest thing. So that the purpose of music, in a way, is to transcend itself. So when I play the cello, I don't want you to say, oh, what a re really wonderful cellist. He makes such good sound or this. That's all good. But you want to get to, what's the point? The reason for music to exist, the reason for what is actually being connected. And I would say that's the same thing for all of us humans, for people in government, for people in, in academia, for people in business. You're trying to connect people. And I think that's the essence of creativity, in my, in my mind, is right. when you make those connections. Well, then on the science front, we talk so much about big data. Data is only valuable if we translate it into something. So for you, sitting at MIT, you created the mediated, uh, yeah. excuse me, matter. How does that work? What do you do in that research group with all of this information, and how do you translate that into content that we need? Yeah, so first of all, I should say that not all that counts can be counted, as Einstein said, and that includes Yo-Yo and Beethoven and all the great artists of our time and previous times. And, um, and, and you know, it's interesting how the things, um, as they say, that are least important for our survival are the things that make us human. Say that um, again. The things that are least important for our survival are the things that makes, make us most human. Um, on the one hand, it's true. On the other hand, it isn't. Because if you think about the cave paintings as an art form, this was actually, I'm just, I'm just thinking with you out, li out loud. Uh, if you think about the, the cave paintings as an art form, they were not just art, because no one actually saw them when they were drawn and painted 40,000 years ago. Um, they were a way for the people who drew them in the cave, while it was dark, by the way, to represent their reality in order to understand their reality and therefore act upon their reality. 
So maybe what I said um, that has been said before isn't that true. And that's sort of where they come together. Um, but about data, it's, it's a big question. Um, I hate big data, and I like small data. <laughs> Don't tell Google. And, <laughs> um, and, and I, I do believe in what Joseph Boyce said, the artist is the smallest entrepreneur, um, and that being able to, um, in all of this field, these big, big, big fields and landscapes of data, um, to be able to make connections that are meaningful. And I think that is what designers do so well. They have great taste in synthesis. I think of design as having good taste in synthesis and bringing these uh, different data types together, whether those are uh, units of um, voxels of computational design or units that are genes um, or units that are molecules. It does not matter, but it is about being able to translate those units um, and synthesize them to build something meaningful in the world. I think, Neri, that the reason you hate big data is because... I love your music. No, it's because you don't want to be an algorithm. <laughs> no, I do not. You're not I an algorithm. Not. No. Some of your it's behavior true. can be part of an algorithm. But I think that, that somehow you don't fall in love with, a, with an algorithm. Or I hope yeah. none of you do. Or or you should talk to me afterwards. <laughs> but, but it can be very elegant if yes, you don't I, fall in love with it. But, but to your point of, of, of asking about the connections, I would like to say that uh, people who are inquisitive, journalists, scientists, humans, artists. artists, the idea that you go towards what you don't know yeah. is really huge. So for all the things that we know, that's actually piddly stuff, even though we feel so powerful. And we are powerful because we actually are, these days, responsible. We know so much. We're so culturally sophisticated that we, like Eric Kendall says, we're responsible for our own destiny and evolution. So that means we have to be responsible for the Homo sapiens as a species. Mm -hmm. Because we can easily mm -hmm. knock ourselves out or we can find a way to survive. And mm -hmm. People are talking about that these days. So not to include the space between life and death, not to include even there are, though there are people who say we can live forever, that's yet to be proven. But the, the point is that we can only ch achieve a conversation that's meaningful enough that when Neri says, I've done something, I've proven it, it can be replicated. If I do something, the only reason that it's worth doing is if we each remember something about it tomorrow. Because if you don't, then we might as well not have been here together. And so memory, I think I'd like to add that as one of the most important uh, elements of what makes us human. Mm -hmm. Then if what makes us extraordinary is our curiosity, is technology a positive or a negative? Because there's this quick headline that we hear all the time that in this connected world, we lose curiosity. When we want answers to questions, they're at our fingertips so we don't need to discover. So that's sort of the immediate response, this fear in a connected world, no one is out there discovering. Or is the answer the opposite? Because we're so connected, we can explore everything because it's right here. Well, fire was the first technology and it was a kind of a form of an internet, wasn't it? It brought people together around the heat, and, um, and they could cook, and they could um, uh, create signposts of how they were, um, uh, you know, inhabiting the land, and, um, and so I, 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 I think technology is wonderful in bringing people together and being able to share Enable to turn information into knowledge, and enable to share um, 
to share common wisdoms. It's dangerous, of course, as every technology is. And just as fire was. Just as fire was. And, uh, and so, so I think it defines, um, it defines the, the human condition, not even the cultural condition, but the human condition, um, and it will just continue to grow, and I'm so excited to be part of, part of this future. So, so very excited. Um, it's in everything we do. What do you think? What do I think? Yes. <laughs> I think I read, well, well, I'm cheating because I read this article in the, in the New Yorker on the way here. That doesn't mean you're cheating. There's no new ideas. I Just can't, take them. I can't remember who it was written by, but it was, a, it was about this new book, here. Against the Grain. Uh -huh. And they said, they talked about the evolution of a civilization, and in the article they talk about how, I think it was the chimpanzee has like an intestine that, that's five times bigger because they didn't have access, because they, they were consuming raw food, um, and they didn't have access to fire in order to cook, which uh, increased the caloric intake and the ability of humans, the homo sapiens, or the homo erectus rather, mm -hmm. um, to consume food in a way that was so much more sophisticated required much less uh, of a digestive system and a much more compact and sophisticated brain. Um, so, it's, so technology is really not only for us to use, but for us to define who we are. I think there was, there was this wonderful line there in the article which talked about how fire defined the difference between um, eating something and being something, and uh, it, it was great. So, so I, think, I think this is true of all technologies that, that we create. And you do have an answer. You shrug, but you do. Think about in your art, or let's call it your business, being as connected as we are, is it a positive or a negative? Think of back, think, take yourself back five years, 10 years, 20 years, when you were learning and studying and building, and now, how easy it is for you to connect and see. Do you discover as much today? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I just have to say that, that um, to Neri's point, and, and I think that everything we do that we invent is in some ways in itself value neutral. Technology is not good or bad. Art is not good or bad. It's what, it's what we do with it. It doesn't... People are not good or bad. Exactly. The problem is us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's How not, we it's not technology. It's always us. We do great things and we do horrible things. And we do everything in between. Mostly everything in between. And, and I think unless we can actually acknowledge that yeah. and not demonize somebody else because all we need to do is look at ourselves. I mean, we've had psychological experiments that have proven that over and over again. So it's not, you know, it's, it's the, I think, examination of ourselves and who we are, why we exist, and what we want our children, grandchildren to, to, yeah. to be and live in the world. I mean, that's, and that's it. If science and technology are advancing at great strides, are humans advancing and evolving now that we have more and more information and ability, what are we doing with it? Mm -hmm. That's the big question, right? I, I don't think we're evolving as fast as our inventions are. I might argue we're going backwards. Well, I, I don't want to you know, <laughs> suggest that because you know, that we're, this is a positive group. You know, we're trying to kind of... <laughs> you know, we're trying, we're trying to but a positive them. group and maybe a call to action. Yes, that's, that's why solve is so important. That's why what MIT does is important. And if you don't mind, would, you, would it be horribly offensive if I tried to give an example by playing a piece of music that is... Don't do it. The, yeah, of course. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> no, no, so, but, but for yes, purpose. Yes, no, yes, of it's, course. No, it's, it's Are not you just, kidding? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Jessica, Turco, thank you very much. Um, um, but it's not so much to... Um, it's, it's actually a piece of music that I'd like to suggest is about sound asking a question. Wow, yes. You know, We're so honored. So it's a little abstract, and if you think, you know, what's going on, 
it starts like Just a pleasure. No, oh, come on. Come on. Neri, you're leaving Neri, us? Neri, 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 Neri. We're not letting Neri. you away. I Sorry, I thought this, that what, you, you have, no, no, after no, you hear no. Neri, you die, so, so and question. then you come to life. So I was just going through my thing. Okay. Well, <laughs> the goal thing. of the panel is to, you know, to solve the world's challenges through yeah. art and okay. science, and he just did. So you know what? We're done. Okay. No, but did, <laughs> did people get the idea that there's so many ways to ask a question? It's true. Yeah. Yes, maybe? Did you feel there was a question? Did it feel like a, should I not have done it? I mean, it's like, is it, it's, it's not that we have answers, but we have temporary answers. Yeah. We have occasional answers, you know, the little kid that says, mommy, mommy, why, 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 why? It's a shut up kid, you know. It's like, because you don't have all the answers. None of us have all the answers. But if we can work on getting temporary solutions that work for now, 
But if we actually leave enough space in our minds that can allow future generations to build on top of what we have built, but to make sure that the building blocks are strong enough and they don't fall apart as soon as someone else puts another brick on it because then the whole building's gonna collapse. So that's, you know, that's, that's, that's all we can do. Well, with the use of technology and checking our phones on average 200 times a day, it's that conscious effort of leaving that space in your mind yes. that's the challenge because right now our minds are crowded and cluttered with information. So from a science perspective, when you see a performance like this, and then you go back to your lab, and you have challenges on your team, things like sustainable urban communities, massively important but gargantuan tasks, how do you even approach them at a time like this? You don't straighten curly hair. <laughs> you're just, <laughs> sorry, you're just, these problems um, have a form and you just have to embrace them as a whole. And when you start taking them apart and breaking them into parts and assigning a discipline to them and assigning a scale to them is when you lose the whole. And art, um, art is greater than the sum of its parts. Art creates experiences in the world that cannot be broken into parts. It'll, it'll, I, I like to use the analogy of the soup and the salad. A great engineer, engineering project is a great salad. What you know what you're putting in, and when you're eating, you understand your experience because you know what went into the production or the creation of the salad. But when you're eating a soup, you don't exactly know what went into it, and you can't take the parts apart. Uh, and you're creating this experience um, that's bigger than the sum of its parts. So what was the question? Sorry. <laughs> how do you, how, how do I how approach, do you approach, so I approach these, these gargantuan, problems I mean, solve, solve, solve is addressing problems yeah, exactly. that we can't even get our heads around. Absolutely, and solve is the solution that is also the problem because the word solve, um, it's an interesting word, isn't it? Because it assumes that there's a problem. That it also assumes that there's an end. And you are so right. And that's exactly my point, that there is no end. And there is, a, in a way, no beginning. And I think that great problem solvers are also great problem seekers. And so I think that in a pro the way that I approach problems in the lab is by treating, treating them as soups, not as salads, um, and, um, and trying to uh, respect uh, their ambiguity. Uh, you can't solve global, war global warming by getting a PhD in thermodynamics. You can't solve cancer by focusing on um, synthetic, synthetically engineered microbes or, or doing single cell genomics. I these problems are so complex that they require taste in synthesis and they require an ability uh, to bring people and ideas um, and discoveries together. Uh, and, and, I think, and I think that's an art form in its own right. Mm -hmm. Right, Yo-Yo? You agree with me? Absolutely. Yeah. I, the <laughs> organic nature of exact what, what yeah. you're talking about is absolutely true. Taste in editing, what stories go on the news, who chooses, why, to know really deeply what those reasons are. And, yeah. you know, for everything that, that, that we do, if we examine carefully what, what are the motivations? Why are we all here? Uh, obviously for a spe specific purpose, but what, what else, what are the other reasons that we're and here? And then if we, do, if we operate from that m mode, we discover um, tools or answers to problems maybe we thought didn't exi exist. And so that's why question, that's why I like a question so much more than I like an answer. But could the answer be give less information, put less art out there? Or you mentioned the news is the answer 
editing or restraint because right now we're putting so much out there that we can't necessarily dissect everything, we can't hear every note, and in news, it becomes white noise. But you have the choice on what you want to put on the news. I mean, I think, so that's, it, it, it's it, the news cycle, the way we talk about it is that, sure, you have a 24-hour news cycle, you have to fill the time, but actually, uh, you know, if we're, if we're driven by numbers, which often we have to be, which is correct for many circumstances, but I think you have lots of choices on, on describing what Mary is talking about. Why is she saying questions are more important than solutions? Mm. That's not practical. That doesn't help me. But actually, maybe it does help if we ask questions that we can't answer. That's what I always say to, to kids, is that you know, they, it's good to ask questions you can't answer because 20 years from now, if you've been asking those some questions, you will find an answer somewhere along the line. But it doesn't necessarily give you an immediate answer. So yes, but the other part of learning is that you do want to have enough answers along the way that it leads you to asking bigger and bigger questions. So I think, you know, and both are true. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a difference between data creation and data curation. And I, I think you're talking about um, how do we as humans live uh, uh, amongst the data um, as opposed to how this data might serve new discoveries in science um, in, and, and uh, allow, enable, empower new expressions in art. And I think these are slightly different Mm, paths or directions um, uh, in, in this question, but, but I, I agree with Yo-Yo. Um, it's the choice that we make, uh, both in creating the data and curating the data um, and consuming the data um, that defines uh, who we are and how we are. And to your question about uh, is technology advancing faster than um, us humans or vice versa, um, my answer would be they are not mutually exclusive. They are, our technologies are affecting who we are and we are building those technologies. So the more we consume data in a certain way, our brain structures literally change mm -hmm. and literally evolve um, to, to shrink at the face of the iPhone. I mean, it, we have to, uh, not, not the design, but the, the, the access to this immense, uh, immense quantity of data. Um, and so I think we should, um, it's important to differentiate between um, difference in degree and difference in kind. And, uh, and to know when we want more of something and when we want to make that something different, of a different kind. Um, yeah, but well, we're, we're evolving. The technology in a way is, uh, is, is, we're creating technology, but in a way, it's also our creator. So it's... Yeah, that's right. It is, but we talk so much today about brain health while we're putting so much anxiety on ourselves because of our access to technology. But before we go, I have to ask, and I know uh, we're talking about unsolvable problems, but for you, in what you create, in what you make, in the world that you see, what is it that you like to solve for? What is it that you'd like to work towards? Um, okay, I'm going to say something kind of weird. Go for uh, it. Is that right? Okay. Um, yes. So there's apparently <laughs> a, an experiment, and you'll forgive me if I say, um, I call it the rat park. Rat, R-A-T. Right? So basically, rats are given two choices. Nice drinking water and water laced with opioids. Which water do the rats drink? The opioids, because it's more exciting. So the rat park is a new element introduced to those rats. And, and so it's got fun things wheels, things you can chew on, you can kind of run it's like around. A nightclub exactly. For rats. It's fabulous. So 
So now a subset of the rats experience the rat park and the other subset does not. So then same experiment on water, pure water, or water laced with opioids. It turns out that the rats that have experienced rat, the rat park, once they try both waters, they pick the pure water. Really? Yeah. Now, what does that tell us about stress? If you have, you mentioned stress, we all, sup, I think, all have, how do we regulate stress? So, after a long day, you know, bad news cycle, you go home, what do you do? Eat. Right? Have a drink. Have a drink. Or some, you know, wonderful people go exercise or do something. And Solve the differential so. equation. Exactly. Exactly. Just for, exactly. Just to calm down. Solve but the you differential do equations, <laughs> and I picked eating. Right. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, between the two, actually, I would choose the <laughs> drink. <laughs> No, but, but you would do something that is the opposite of what, you know, that this, it's like a, you create another muscle. And, and I... But that and, takes discipline that and takes, thoughtfulness. Or just awareness that what creates mental health is actually right in front of us and that we can actually, whether you're a high school student dealing with time management issues or a single mother dealing with three kids and, you know, you have no so many issues that you can't deal with. How do you actually do this stress regulation? I think that's something I would love to solve that because mm. if, we, if we did that, uh, but that involves a lot of things mm. and a lot of knowledge being there constantly, uh, uh, you're aware of what's stressing you out. And, but it could be your choice but then you have to realize what has to go. Isn't choice it. the answer though? Choosing to not let life happen to you, but for you to make decisions about your life. Well, have you heard about the, uh, um, our second brain, the stomach? I barely have the... one. <laughs> I know you barely have a stomach. Uh, but, um, but apparently they now say that you know, the microbes in our, you know, gut bacteria will actually determine what we, we want. we fall in love with, seriously. Yeah, and before you true. even are conscious of it. Very true. So what happened to free choice? Is that all? It's awful? all in the gut. Right. I mean, true. I mean, so... That is scientifically proven. Yeah, exactly. So, so <laughs> what, you know, but we have to put all of this new information in context, in context of of saying, you know, we can't always be masters of our destiny. You know, there's a lot of chance involved. Accidents happen, and we have to deal with it. It's not, you're not the insurance company that says, you're gonna live to be 100 and everything's gonna be great. We can't, we can't assure that of people. Life happens, and the so-called other stuff happens too. So, so I, I just think that, it would be really cool if we all got together and realized that, yes, we don't have to be as stressed out about everything because a lot of things are beyond our control. And you can let that happen. But some things, your own attitude is something you can really control. Alas, we started talking art and science and we end on drugs and sexual attraction. That's a, that's a panel. <laughs> that's so thank you. Thank you. That's what it all boils down to. Thank you. The Lasco Caves. Thank you both. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.